Good morning to everyone. Uh, welcome to our discussion on this week's Parsha, which is Parsha's Bullock. And it's, it's a unique Parsha. It, it is one that the action is not followed from within the nation, but rather from the outside. So we're having an external view of the people of Israel. Uh, how are we viewed from the outside? Now, unfortunately, it's not always positive. And the world is very fascinated by Jews. The world is actually obsessed with Jews. And it's something we all feel we all notice, uh, you follow the media, you, you, you follow what is uh, discussed by intellectuals. There's an obsession about the Jews. And as a result, as uh, we've married it to see a Jewish state, uh, this obsession relates to Israel as well. Now, before we start getting depressed, we have to realize that there's a good reason why everyone is looking towards the people of Israel, the land of Israel. It is because we do play a role, and it's something tradition teaches us. And I think there's no other way to understand the, the way the world works without appreciating that idea that we play a significant role. We are here to influence the world. And when within nature itself, just as you have plants that early in the morning are gonna be facing uh, the east towards the sun and late afternoon towards the west, it's within nature, it's within the nature of humanity to turn towards the Jews and wonder what they are doing, what they are about. Uh, there are those among the nations that actually have very positive feelings towards us. And we view those as people who are getting a light from the future, right? It's fundamental for us to believe there's going to be a period of time when humanity will recognize that there is a higher being, and we, the people of Israel, have a role. So there are people that are getting orot, like lights, from the future. And unfortunately, there are others that get lights from the past. And that is after the people of Israel experienced revelation. At Ma'amad Har Sinai, the rabbis link the word Sinai to Sina, to hatred. They simply feel uncomfortable after it. The Jew symbolizes this idea of responsibility and no one likes being placed in a situation where they are getting that constant reminder. And that perhaps is one of the many roots of anti-Semitism. So we are entering into a parasha where we are viewed from the outside, unfortunately, it's a negative one. And as in our, our tradition, we always mention the fact that if you are looking for a, a persona or for a nation that symbolizes pure hatred of the people of Israel, pure hatred, meaning it can't be attributed to an issue of land. In other words, it comes to come, when it comes to the Palestinians, for example, and uh, many of them hate us. But you could relate it to the fact that we do know that some of them, right, actually had properties prior to 1948 and they lost it. That means there's something there. You have to recognize that there's something there. I'm not going to label the Palestinians Amalek. I have many other issues. Uh, they have leaders that are not concerned about them. Uh, they're basically are brutal, corrupt leaders who are manipulating them for their own personal, and we all know it, we're educated, but I'm not gonna label them Amalek, simply I'm not. The Germans, I'm gonna label Amalek. 
right? When you have a nation that wants to simply uproot a Jewish race, they are Amalek. And as we interact here with these two personalities of Balak and Bilam, Balak and Bilam, and you're going to take the last two letters of Bilam, the Ayn and the Mem, and the last two letters of Balak, Lamed and Ekuf, you do get Amalek. Okay, so it's a little ver- vert. It's not uh, a, a basic reading of the text, but I think there's nothing wrong with seeing within them, and especially when they come together, when they come together. And what is coming together here is someone with a desire, a desire to uproot the Jewish people, which is Balak. Balak has that desire. And someone with the tools, with great tools. And that is Bilam. And that's the one that's we're going to try to study exactly. What is this fellow Bilam about? What is he about? Because anyone reading the parsha should be a little bit complex. He has superpowers. I mean, superpowers, the ability to manipulate nature. Fine, as Jews, we've been trained that this concept exists. We've been trained that there are people that could talk to God. There, we have been trained to believe, and it's fundamental, that their nature does not limit the creator. And when the Almighty wants to do good for the people of Israel... He's going to go ahead and limit nature and allow something supernatural uh, to dictate what is taking place. We're familiar. I mean, we all believe in Yitziat Mitzrayim, Kriyat Yam Suf, uh, surviving 40 years in the wilderness. We accept that. Well, that is always viewed because the will of God. But suddenly we enter into a section where we are introduced to someone who has superpowers. I mean, this is a Disney character, a Marvel character. He has superpowers because, number one, he is identified as someone who could bless and curse. And if they are putting so much effort into it, it seems to be that there's something there. So you're going to say, okay, so pagan cultures were easily fooled. Right. In other words, it's like the person who could, there are people out there that could uh, tell you 10 times in a row regarding a specific stock, what direction it's going to go. There are such people. Why? Because they are able to predict a specific stock and you are getting that information regarding a specific stock, but you don't know that they told 250 other people advice that was wrong. In other words, Sometimes we have situations that you think someone sees the unseen uh, when basically, you know, there are times that you could flip a coin and it lands on the right side. And if you do it and spread it to enough people, in other words, if I turn to 30 people and I turn to them and to some I say, buy IBM and sell IBM. So I'm going to be right for 15 of them, right? And then afterwards I say to the 15 of them, half, well, it's hard to say 15 half, but seven buy uh, eBay and eight sell eBay. So the result is that I'm going to be right. And the the more people I put into this pool, uh, the more I look like a tremendous gaon. And if I advertise correctly, in other words, instead of 30, I do it with 2000 people. Eventually, you'll do the numbers for me. I can have a situation that there was one person out there that Eight times in a row, I predicted the right stock. And if I'm good in marketing, I could share and have that person share that information. And they tell the world that I see the unseen when it comes to the stock market. And I could start publishing books, right? So one would claim, okay, if 3,400 years ago, there are some primitive people that believe that Bilam could curse. Come on, I mean... Is that going to convince me? Well, I think afterwards, if you read in this week's Parsha, God does appear to him. So there's something about God and Bilam. There is some form of communication, right? And this is in the Torah. And when you continue reading, he has this fascinating conversation with a donkey. 
So you might claim maybe it's a vision where there were some commentators that believed it was a vision. Uh, but if you work with a simple reading, this is not someone that's working within nature. So what's going on here? How, how do we understand this fellow Bilam? That's what we're going to try to do a little bit. One more question I would like to ask is the following. Uh, when, when I come to shul in the morning, I pick up a sitter. And to be honest with you, I don't have the ability to say everything that's in the sitter. I simply don't. There's a lot there. But thank God we're educated and we know what's considered a priority and what is considered a nice thing if you do have the time. And so I know that the brachot, <clears throat> right? I can't, you can't have a day without it, right? The brachot, you can't have a day without it. Birkota Torah, Birkota Torah, you got to say them. You got to be grateful for our tradition and Torah. It doesn't work without it. The brachot that we have, that list, you can't have a day without it. That I know. Okay, it's interesting that there, there is an Israeli actress, an Israeli actress, I think her last name is Wertheimer. And in Israel, the uh, TV shows and TV series that relate to Haredim are number one done very well because uh, often they are, they are written by people who originated in the Haredi community and they seem to be off, off this charts brilliant. So for example, Shtisel, which some of you I'm sure uh, followed, Shtisel, brilliant writing, brilliant, magnificent writing. And then there was a series that gained popularity in Israel, something called Shabavnikim, if I'm not mistaken, which also became quite popular in Israel. Now, although the writers uh, come from the Haredi community and work, he put some of them from my understanding, when it comes to the actors and actresses, uh, they didn't come from that environment. But again, we're dealing with talented people and they picked up. They picked up how to do it and what to say. Uh, but it seemed to be not enough. So they sent the actors and actresses to spend time, to spend time in either Me'asharim in, in Haredi neighborhoods to understand a little bit about the culture. And it was for them a complete culture shock coming from Tel Aviv where they never interacted with such people, never. And every single one of them from the interviews I remember reading what, were, was simply blown away and impressed by the lifestyle. They really saw the good. And the families that welcomed them knew very well that they're welcoming people not to influence them to become Balei Tshuva. They knew very well what the agenda was, but they were welcoming people. It was a real, real beautiful success story. One of those that when we read about news from Israel, that's what we really should be focused on, such stories. So this actress, Wertheimer, completely secular, uh, She's even married to someone from one of the left parties in the Knesset or was in the Knesset. I don't know exactly the details. But as she's interviewed after this whole experience, <clears throat> she said that it was incredible. I've been, I was very touched with them. And she said that the one thing I took after going through the series, and she acted in this Shobavnikim series as an educated Haredi woman, that what I took from it is that I don't have a day that I don't say brachot every morning. Meaning even after the series end and she returned to regular life, she simply got this appreciation that you start your day with the brachot. So every day, birkot shachar, the blessings. Birkot and the blessings that we say, that's part of her life. Right, so a clear indication that that's fundamental. Now, what am I getting to? They're among the sections that I don't have the opportunity to say every day, but nevertheless, they're printed in Sidurim. There's a section that has a compilation of verses from different sources in Tanakh. And it starts off with a verse from our Parsha. And the words are words that we are very familiar with. Ma tovu ohalecha Yaakov, mishkinotecha Yisrael. Oh, how good 
are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. Nice verse. There are many songs. I have a feeling that many of you could remember some songs from different Pirche groups of Matovu. And it made it into Sidur. Now, the question is, is, is it not odd to start our day and perhaps to start our journey in a synagogue with a blessing that came out of the mouth of someone who had the desire to uproot us? I mean, imagine, okay, imagine if God would have controlled the mouth of Himmler, Yamar Shemo, and some nice things would have come out from his mouth. Would you feel comfortable starting your day with it as you enter into a shul? And while I mention it as a question that begs an answer, there was a great rabbi in Lublin in the 16th century, Rabbi Shlomo Luria, and the marshal was struggling with this question. And his answer was, you know what? I'm not saying it. That was his answer. I'm, just not, I'm not saying that. I'll start with the next verse. There's a whole series of verses. So I'm guilty for not saying any of those verses daily because I, you know, I, don't, I, I, I rush. I don't come early enough. But the question is a good one. How did he make it in? I mean, isn't this, what's, what's it all about? And it's a winner of a verse. Like this some, is something that needs clarity. So we're going to try to understand a little bit about Bilam because he's a fascinating character and also relate a little bit to this verse. Now, for those of you who uh, read comic books as children, or for those of you who like the idea of uh, villains and superheroes, so I think you know the rule, the Marvel rule is, is that if you have a villain with superpowers, there must be the hero with matching powers. Otherwise, it's not fun, right? If the Spider-Man doesn't have the Green Goblin, it's not a good Spider-Man, right? If uh, Superman, I don't even know who he fights, but Batman, I know it's uh, the Joker. So that's how things work. There's the good and the bad. So my question is, when it comes to Bilam, and he was given these incredible, incredible tools. These are tools, meaning if you have the power of speech, and when you read his work, by the way, when you read his words, yes, they were manipulated by a Kodesh Baruch Hu, but he's a poetic guy, it seems to be. I mean, I can't read this Parsha without going through the commentators because there's a lot of poetry there. You know, to give you an example of the, the depth of those statements made by him. And why you better come well prepared to read this whole Parsha, I'll give you the following example. That when Bilam uh, is expressing, and again, he has a desire, he has a deep desire to curse. Kodesh Baruch Hu manipulates his words and they come out in a positive way. <clears throat> but nevertheless, it is coming out of a person so the person is sharing and utilizing whoever, whatever uh, poetic abilities he has. So he says that you should know that this is a nation. The nation of Israel are ones, kitoafot re'emlo. They are, they have like the horns of a wild ox. They have like the horns of a wild ox. Now, I don't know if that's considered a great compliment. I don't know if I would be once at a dinner and they're honoring a shul member. And if I would get up and would say this fellow, right? Also from a non-Jew, the very Jewish wedding. Uh, that's true. There's another case. Good. David has a good question. Torah IQ is, is really rolling here. So Imagine if I'm at an event, right? They're honoring a shul member, and I say, oh, he's such an incredible guy. When I look at him, I think of the horns of a wild ox. Do you think uh, the family would appreciate what I said about the honoree? Right? I, 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 I don't know. So what's the idea of the horns of a wild ox? So commentators know, comes this Sforno, for example, and he says... 
This keto afot reemlo, like the horns of a wild ox, is something saying something quite incredible about the Jewish people. You know, animals attack. Animals attack. You don't want to, if you ever may go for a tour in Africa after this COVID is over, you might want to visit a safari. You don't want to be stuck in a safari, right? Because lions are not pleasant to be around when they're hungry. No question about it. A lion, when it attacks, it goes at it, devours the person, it rips it to pieces, and that's how it's, it functions. When it comes to the, this wild ox, it attacks with its horns, meaning it wants to push you away. It pushes you away with something not integrally part of the body, not its head, but something in front of its head. And says this Farno, you should know that when Bilam ha expresses the significance of the people of Israel, the significance of the people of Israel is that even though they were given the land of Israel, their deep desire was not to enter and conquer and destroy and kill people. That wasn't their desire. Because do you know that Yehoshua Binun before entry sent notification to the leaders in Eretz Yisrael and told them, listen, it's our land, Harotzeh lefanot ifneh. You're more than welcome to leave, right? You're more than welcome to leave. I remember uh, once I was in Israel a few years ago, and I was in the Angel Bakery, Angel Bakery, uh, which is in Kiryat Moshe, and I, I had my a hat with me, and my hat fell down, so I was going to bend it up to pick it up, so it seems like the guy behind me was much faster than me, because by the time I started bending down, he already grabbed it, with enthusiasm to do an act of kindness and handed it to me. I say, thank you. And then I look at the fellow and I was surprised. It was a fellow by the name of Moshe Feiglin. I don't know if you've heard of Moshe, Moshe Feiglin. So Moshe Feiglin, when he sees an opportunity to do an act of kindness, it seems like he moves very, very fast. Okay, I was I schmoozed him a little bit. Now what's the agenda of Moshe Feiglin? So he's obviously more on the right of things, but his desire is, I, I don't like I don't like the idea that we have to go ahead and kill people to defend the Jewish state. I don't want to kill people in Aza. I don't want to kill Hamas. I want to encourage them to move. Unfortunately, when he says this publicly, you know what country he wants them to move to? Canada. Okay, so let, putting that aside, but his idea is, let them leave. We'll help them. We'll help them with immigration. We have Jewish lawyers, right? We have Jewish lawyers, even here in the show, that will help them with immigration. Let them leave. Now, Moshe Flaglin was inspired by Yehoshua. That Yehoshua, as they were preparing to enter the land of Israel, given to the people of Israel by God, there were people who were there who did not belong there. It wasn't their region because it was a region given to shame, to the children of shame, and they are children of Ham. They don't belong there. So what do you do? So as a Jew... Your deep desire should be not to kill them. Not, that's not what we want. We want something ahead of us to push them away. As Yeshua said to them, if you guys want to leave, leave. If you want to stay and become subservient and follow our values, we could, we could work things out with you as well if you want. Meaning we Jews want something ahead of us to push them aside or to work something out. It's only the last option that we act as a lion. And therefore, this Forna says, when Bilam is using his words in a very poetic way to describe the people of Israel and their magnificence, he says that they have horns like the wild ox. They want to push things away. They don't want to act like a lion. So this is rich language, right? This Bilam fellow is incredible Bilam. But uh, what I really want to get to is who is the positive side of the Bilam? In other words, if Bilam is the villain, who's supposed to be our hero? Okay, that's the question we're going to ask. Who's the hero of the story? So some rabbinic sources would seem to indicate, 
and I'm not going in that direction, but some would seem to indicate that it is Moshe. Why? Lokam Navi Israel Kimoshe Od, like Moshe, there was no one like among the Israelites, but it seemed to be that the toolbox, his abilities, his potential, seemed to be comparable in some ways to Moshe. Bilam was comparable to Moshe. And the explanation given is that you should know Moshe Rabbeinu was an incredible person, completely devoted to his people, completely devoted to his values. But nevertheless, that which he merited from the creator was way beyond his natural abilities, right? So he received something from above that was way beyond, even though he was the most accomplished individual, what he received was way beyond what he could have ever reached. So Lahav Dil Bilam, according to this rabbinic approach, was the same way. Now, he didn't try at all. He didn't grow at all. He was a, a pit of a person, meaning there was no growth. There was no focus on self-development. There was no concern for others. This was not a, a, a person who worked on himself. But the abilities, just as Moshe received way beyond his natural abilities, so to Bilam. So there are those who compare him to Moshe Rabbeinu. Bilam is compared the hero to our villain is Moshe Rabbeinu. So that's an approach. But what we're going to work it is with the rabbis who tell us, you want to understand who Bilam is fighting? You want to understand who the hero is in this story? You want to know who to be inspired by as you read the story? Meaning now that you read about the fall of a person, you want to remember who you're yes supposed to learn from? And the answer is Avraham Avinu. It's all about Avraham Avinu. And he is the party that you are supposed to remember as you read this Parsha. And when you talk about a person waking up early in the morning to go ahead and saddle his donkey. You know what we are told? That HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you know, Bilam, you know, you're, you're saddling uh, your donkey, Vayachbosh et Chamoro. So the rabbis say, Kvar kidmecha Avraham Avinu. You know, you're not going to succeed. You're not going to succeed. You're not going to hurt the people of Israel. Why? Because Avraham Avinu got up even earlier, Vayashkem Avraham Babok. In other words, you, Vayakam, you woke up Bilam regular time. There's someone that did for the Jewish people that has far more commitment, Avraham Avinu. So it's all about Avraham Avinu. And just one detail, you know, we call Avraham, Avraham Ha Ivri. Ivri. Remember, my older brother had a collection of stamps. I wonder if he still has it or not. He had a collection of stamps and he was very organized and he had this magnificent album with many old Israeli stamps. And he had a whole series of stamps, I think it's from 1948 even, that, that said on it, Doar Ivri. Doar Ivri. And what's the Doar Ivri? So that was, it seems to be before Medinat Israel. Uh, published or printed their own stamps, which in the old days, you, people used to collect stamps. I wonder if today any kid still collects stamps. They're busy with collecting apps and Pokemons and who knows what. I don't know if stamps are still, I don't even coins. I had a coin collection. Fortunately, I don't have it anymore. But uh, times have changed. Coins and stamps, at least there's an interest in the world, right? Different countries, you know, where they are, right? Go ask a kid where Yugoslavia is, right? Go ahead, have some fun. So times have changed, obviously. So Doar Ivri. Now, why are Jews called Ivrim? Ivri Anochi. Why is Avraham Avinu called the Ivri? So some say, well, they're descendants of Aver, but the explanation that really defines who we are, Avraham Avinu 
to make his journey that changed the world had to cross the river. He had to cross the river, the Euphrates. When he crossed the river, he left humanity on the other side. And there's a river that separates us. When you interact with people that are not of our faith, reality is, right, you could respect them. There's some incredible people. They do nice things. But there's a river. There's something that separates us. And it's because of Abraham Avinu that crossed the river. And we are Ivriim. We're on the other side of things. Right? We're never going to have the ability to have a deep, deep relationship with someone that's not a, on our side of the river. Avraham Ha'ivri. So my father would note that Bilaam was given these incredible tools, incredible tools, to go ahead and communicate with God, have the power of speech, be a personality that was hired, right? Today, you know, you bring in speakers from other regions or countries, you pay them who knows how much. Bilam was that speaker of that period of time. He was a powerful poet. He had, at least they believed, the ability to curse and the ability to bless. He had the ability to communicate with God. You know what Bilam could have done, could have done with all his strengths and abilities he could have been like that bridge on a river he could have bridged the gap right when we believe that there's going to be a time that we could relate to humanity that we're going to have the same agenda that we're going to have this understanding that there's a higher being and what he wants from us we that's fundamental for us jews to believe we don't want to spend eternity on the other side of the river we want to connect we want to bring them we want the world to come together. We need someone to bridge that river, to be on the river, al Hanahar. Bilam had that potential. So therefore, my father notes that when you look where these messengers went to get Bilam, Vaishlach Malachim, so Balak sends, in this week's Parsha, verse 5 in the beginning, Balak sends messengers to Bilam, and he was in a place called Pethor. And you want to know where it was? al Hanahar. So when you read it, you can read it by the river. But my father says, no, you know what we're being told here? He was on the river, on the river. He had the ability to bridge that gap, the every element that separates us from humanity. He was, he had the potential to be Al Hanaar. So again, you see this idea that there's a relationship between Abraham Avinu, the hero, and unfortunately the villain. And even the idea that when they come to him and they say, Listen, Bilam, we would love to hire you because we understand that you have these incredible powers. Because we know in verse 7. If you bless someone, he's blessed. You are. If you curse them, they're cursed. And you hear the words, and you think that sounds like the beginning of Parshat Lech Lecha. Here we go again, the same words, the same language is used for Bilam, as it related to Avraham Avinu. Now, commentators do note, by the way, the ones who try uh, to explain how exactly did he function. In other words, Bilam, according to tradition, clearly had a very good record of harming people with his words. He cursed. And they seem to say, these commentators, that he was able to identify some kind of spiritual flaw of someone else and focus on it and through it cause damage. However, the rabbis say he had no record of giving any successful blessing. He was a good cursor, nothing else. He had the ability to manipulate the negative, not the positive, but to walk up to him and say, hi, we heard that you curse. 
I use the cursor, right? In the yellow pages, cursor finds the negative. It's not a great way to entice someone to come with this insult, even though it's a fact. Sometimes the most insulting statements are when you share the truth. So therefore they start off with saying, we've heard that you bless people. The Allah he doesn't bless people, but that's the way that they try to bring him into the picture. Okay. So now, if we understand now that it's all about Avraham Avinu, all about Avraham Avinu, what we are being told, and this is what the rabbis are, are going to be telling us, is a very important message. You know, sometimes you have younger people, children, young adults, that people recognize that they have tremendous potential, right? They're very, very smart, very, very smart. Now, I think all of us know that that is not always an indication of success. Because success in Judaism is how you use your tools. Meaning if you use it in a very negative way to harm people, to be hurtful to people, to rip off people, uh, even if you make a lot of money, that doesn't mean you're successful, right? We all know that because if you don't do the right things with it, what kind of life is that? The toolbox does not define you. What defines you is how you are able to deal with your personality. What's your agenda? What's your desire? That's what defines a person. And therefore, I don't want to compare Bilam to Moshe. Yes, perhaps there are similarities in their toolbox, but what defines a person is their attitude, right? Do you have the ability to control yourself? When someone says something to you and you have a line, you could destroy them, but you have self-control because you realize it's not a good thing for the world. It's not what a good Jew should do. If you control yourself, that defines you, right? Not the person that can have that incredible, brilliant, sharp line. That doesn't define you. Self-control defines you. If you see by others success and you are happy for them, even though you yourself perhaps don't have it, that defines you, right? And therefore, the rabbis want us to know that the person you should be comparing Bilam to, and Bilam is the failure, look at Avraham Avinu, he's the success. And here we go. The Mishnah in Avot. It's in the eighth chapter. And the Mishnah tells us that you should know. Kol mi bo shlosha dvarim halal. Whoever has three attributes that are going to be listed. You're a good person. And guess what? You know who you learned from? You are from Talmidav Shel Avraham Avinu. If you, you, you're in control of these three things, which are going to be mentioned very soon, you're a disciple of Avraham Avinu. Unfortunately, if you have the opposite, you're a Talmud. You know who inspired you or you know who you are following? Shel Bilam HaRasha. This is the Mishnah that really is telling us this is the hero and the villain. Now, what are those attributes? The good attributes, number one, Ein Tova, good eye. Look out for the good. Now, it, it relates to any situation in life. See the good in a situation. See the good in another person, right? See that they have, yeah, people are flawed. Every human is. But if you see the good in the other person, uh, first of all, you focus on it, it grows. Reality is that the positive eye, if I go ahead and I turn to a disciple and I say, you know what, you have that specific attribute that you're very good in a specific area, they're going to focus on it. It's going to grow. Have that good eye. Number two of Avraham Avinu on the list. Ruach Nemucha, a humble mind. Humble. I'm not the center of attention. Right? I'm not the center of attention. I am here to play a role. I have a very unique mission. And I'm going to do it because I'm here for someone else, for the higher being. 
And if I don't get the recognition and the honor, it's okay. Ruach nemucha. Next, nefesh shefela, an undemanding soul. I'm okay if I end the day without the most enjoyable steak and wine, even though my neighbor perhaps has it, I'm okay with it. I'm okay that I'm not fulfilling every desire. You are a Talmud Shal Avraham Avinu. Okay, not bad. But if on the other hand, you have an Ein Ra'a, if you have the evil eye, you see the negative. You simply always see the negative and focus on it. And focus on it. And you become obsessed with the negative. And when you think about the other person, the first thing that comes to mind is whatever negative traits they have. Ein Ra'a. Ruach gvoa, I'm the focus of attention. You'll go nuts if you don't get the cover, if you don't get the recognition, and if someone doesn't give it to you, you'll want to kill him because he's taking everything from you. What do you mean you don't recognize me? What do you mean I was mentioned in the speech the third? I'm the most important party. I should be mentioned first. You have problem. You're being inspired by a very problematic individual. Nefesh rechava, you want to fulfill every desire. Every desire. That's your goal. You're the center here. Mital midab shall be Rasha. You are a disciple of Bilam Rasha. Bilam had incredible gifts. He had incredible gifts. But the tragedy was he was self-centered. And he's not living for others. It's all about me. Avraham was all about others. And Avraham Avinu did not have time to meditate because he needed to help others. That's the Avraham Avinu. He sees the good. How on earth was Avraham Avinu able to influence a region? Right? When they talk about Kiruv. Kiruv. So people think that reaching out and teaching about Judaism and influencing people relates to, you know, lectures and intellectual thought. That's not really it. It's if you see in a disciple good, you see good in them, they'll connect with you, right? We all know that, that people who always see the good in others are popular people because you want to interact with someone that sees you as good. That's how it works because they, they're, the, the, the vibes and the interaction is a very positive one. Avraham Avinu without doubt was extremely popular. You know, the Midrash says he had four doors on all sides of his tent. He welcomed people. It doesn't make a difference where they came from. He welcomed them. He signed them a human being, right? There's another human here. I'm going to teach you, with, treat you with dignity. I'm going to treat you with dignity. I think about others. I think about others. That's Avraham Avinu. And now when it comes to Bilam and his failure, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and this is the kindness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that this person with tremendous abilities wants to curse us. And you should know that when we read the poetry of Bilam, and it comes from a very deep place in his heart, but it came and his desire was to focus on the negative. Remember, the negative person who is poetic and really sees the unseen wanted to make statements to hurt the people of Israel regarding their flaws, regarding their flaws. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu worked it out that it came out in a way that the positive was mentioned. And with that, with that, I think we could develop a little bit of appreciation of the Ma Tovu Ahalecha Yaakov. Right? What is it referring to, the tense of Israel? So number one, number one, the rabbis tell us that he noticed as he looked at the encampment of the people of Israel, he noticed that their windows and doors were not facing windows and doors of the other, but rather they worked it out in a way that everyone had their privacy. And there's something good there. You don't look into the other person's tent. You understand that your goal in life is to look into yourself and see how you can make a contribution. It's nice to be inspired by others, but essence of growth is to see what do I have within me that I could use for the good. Matovu. So Mr. Ayn Ra, right, when the person, and he developed an understanding because he knew about that flaw. He knew he was flawed. 
he knew that he had a problem that he saw the negative, and here he sees this positive within the nature, nation of Israel. He is inspired to express it. It also, Matovu Alecha Yaakov refers to our shuls, and it refers to our Bate Midrashot, our houses of study. And that's the reason, at least in the, in the Siddur, and perhaps once in a while when I have time, I could express that idea that I walk into a shul and I say, Ma tovu alecha Yaakov. Now, why is it considered tov? Why is it considered good? Now, what's good about the shul? So explain the commentators among them, the Svarna that you should know. A shul and a bet midrash, it's not just good who, for those who are there, but rather, and I'll read four words for the, from this far now, a shul and a bet midrash, metivim lechol ha'uma. It does good for the whole nation. We all benefit from sh functional shuls. There are prayers here that seem in the spiritual realm to have an impact on the whole Jewish world. Prayers are more impactful when they're made in a shul. We know it. Tradition tells us that it's not just a minion that's important. A minion is nice, but a shul has importance as well. When a person is davening alone, there's still a benefit of davening in a shul, right? Shuls, functional shuls, are good, are good for the nation. It's a little bit of a tragedy that we are facing, that even Bezrat Hashem in two months from now, as we're going to all be fully vaccinated, and we could, Be'ezrat Hashem, return to shuls. Uh, there, it seems to be, and it's from indications of south of the border, their people are not appreciating it. In other words, they, perhaps their presence in shul was an autopilot, so now they've been away for a year and a half. It's a tragedy, because we have to realize it's a good place for the nation. And if you are a Torah Jew, it's somewhere you understand, this is where a person belongs. There might be benefits at times. People have shared with me, Davening alone, I've had my own pace. Good things, true, but there's a benefit in a shul. Metivim lechol auma. And here comes Bilam. And Bilam has clarity that moment. And the man who is selfish, he's extremely selfish. There is nothing he does that's not for himself. Imagine that, a guy with the tremendous abilities to change the world, completely self-centered. And he has that moment of clarity. And he sees the good. And you know why shuls are good? You know why the Bate Midrashot, those studying Torah throughout the Jewish world, they're doing good for the Jewish world, right? You think about it. If, you, if, if you've benefited from the fact that you've traveled somewhere in North America and you walk into a supermarket, into a Piggly Wiggly in somewhere in South Carolina where there are no Jews around at all, and you find hundreds of kosher products, and you say, this is incredible. You get a whole meal. You could get a whole meal in any supermarket anywhere in North America, most probably in other places around the world. Why? Because of the OU. How was the OU able to develop and have such high standards, extremely high standards, that companies don't make a move without approval? How is that possible? It was because there were Bate Midrashot, because great rabbis established institutions in North America where you study Torah, you commit yourself to knowledge, and it produced, and they have access to tremendous talent in the kashrut industry because of these Torah halls. And it's tov, it's good for everyone, we all benefit. And Bill, a Mr. Selfish, when he gets that moment of clarity, he says, you know what, I'm so self-centered, but I'm looking at those institutions that do good to the world, metivim, Lechol ha'uma. That's how you have to view a shul. You drive down Bathurst and you see any shul. Think about a structure that look at this magnificent structure, even if it's an old one, right? Think about the amount of tefillah that was there, the amount of chesed that was there, the influence that lives on, right? You can look upstairs here too and think about, you know, the 60 years of people davening here and the generations that were inspired in Ruth Minyanim who are in Israel now throughout the Jewish world, metivim, good, good, good. And, and those, by the way, who were inspired are inspiring others and perhaps they already inspired others. 
right? The amount of chesed that these institutions are doing, it's all about the other. This is not a selfish structure. Mr. Selfish was like, wow, look at your ability. Look at your ability. And therefore, you know what it's comparable to? Kinechalim. These are like springs. These are like sources of water that spread. Because you should know, just as a spring of water could flow through fields and go miles upon miles, giving sustenance, that is what the shuls are about. And therefore, we are comfortable using these words of Matovu Alecha Yaakov because they come from a very deep place. Because the person who was self-centered and realized where he's going, nowhere, nowhere, and worse, he recognized that moment. Look at those who are doing for others. Think about others. Think about a higher being. That's the incredible power of these words. It's good. Matovu, it's all good. Jews do good. When do they do good? When they are inspired by Avraham Avinu. When they are Talmidav Shel Avraham Avinu. When they are disciples. And what defines a disciple of Avraham Avinu is not the toolbox. And we know it, right? I think we've all interacted with people that have accomplished incredible things with their personality, not because of tremendous talent, but they were able to channel the self. They were not self-centered. They saw the good in others. They did okay if they didn't get all the covet in the world. They did okay because they realized that they're not the purpose of existence. That's a success story. That's a Talmud of Avraham Avinu. And that's what the rabbis want us to walk away from this week's Parsha with. Be a disciple of Avraham Avinu. That's the message of the Parsha. See good, see good. And that's what we are about. Matovu Ohalecha Yaakov. So that's what we have for today. And I do thank everyone for joining us for this year.